In this demo of how I read a chest CT, you'll see how search visual gaze and mouse scrolling patterns are coordinated during chest CT interpretation, and hopefully you'll develop a better appreciation for the amount and intricacy of the tasks involved. How surprisingly bespoke this process is for a modern healthcare system that constantly strives for more standardized processes. Why intra-observer and intra-observer variability exists. How sources of error lurk everywhere and how the way we interpret chest CTs often represents a delicate interplay of accuracy and efficiency. Routine chest CTs are usually composed of several different imaging series. There are usually two actual CT series that represent two different ways of displaying the same CT volume. One is a soft kernel series that is less edge enhanced and less noisy, and the other is a sharp kernel series that is more edge enhanced and also more noisy. We'll use the sharp kernel series when we're looking at the lung parenchyma, and we'll generally use the soft kernel series when we're looking at everything else. Technical details will appear in another series, usually a few images of text and numbers that will tell us things about radiation dose, protocols, and contrast. Localizer images will usually appear in a different series. These are radiograph-like frontal and often also lateral images that the CT technologists used to decide at what table position down to the millimeter a CT scan starts and stops. Sometimes you'll also get an axial MIP series and MPR series that allow you to view the CT volume in the coronal and sagittal planes. A few words about MIPs and MPRs. If you think about it, every axial CT image you look at is a digital image composed of many pixels. Each individual pixel is assigned a color along the spectrum from white to gray to black. Although it may seem like this pixel is a two-dimensional construct, it actually represents a three-dimensional volume that happens to be really squat, like one millimeter tall. The color that pixel is painted is a reflection of what's in the volume it represents, and there are a few different ways of doing that. You can choose to paint the pixel based on what the average attenuation is within the entire volume. That's what we do with normal axial CT images and multiplanar reformatted or MPR images. MPR images are just basically non-axial plane CT images, by the way. If you had a volume that was mostly fat with the tiniest focus of calcification inside, the pixel would appear very dark gray since the average attenuation of the volume remains overwhelmingly fat. On the other hand, if you um, chose to paint the pixel based on what the maximum attenuation is within the entire volume, you'd get a different result. If you did this with the same volume as before, the pixel would now appear white, since the maximum attenuation within the volume was that tiny focus of calcification. CT images created this way are called maximum intensity projection images, or MIPS. Here's a comparison of the same CT volume rendered as an actual MPR on the left and an actual MIP on the right. MIP images tend to make it easier for us to better distinguish nodules from blood vessels, which is why we'll often use MIPS to help us pick up lung nodules. MIPS have downsides though. Sometimes things that aren't lung nodules can be made to look like nodules, and sometimes nodules that are near something else dense, for example, another nodule, can be obscured. But they're a helpful tool, something that we use as an adjunct to our normal actual CT images, but not a replacement. Although the majority of modern PAC stations have two large displays, I like to think of the displays as three display regions. One region where patient information appears, one region where the images of the current study are displayed, and one region where comparison images from the past are displayed. What appears in the information region is mostly text in different windows and panes that help orient me with regards to the study I'm about to read. Um, I'll know where the patient is coming from, the ICU, the trauma bay, outpatient center, for example. I'll obviously get the patient's name, age, and gender, and if I happen to recognize the patient's name, I may instantly know much more about their story without having to do much digging. Age and gender may influence the differential diagnoses I think about if I see something abnormal sometimes. I'll see what the question we're trying to answer with the study is, what kind of provider is ordering it, and I'll also get a list of the patient's prior studies and their associated reports, things that quickly tell me a great deal about the patient before I even open their EMR. Comparison studies will generally appear in the display region to the right. Choosing what to display um, on the comparison um, uh, field depends on what kind of study I'm reading and also its context. With chest CTs, it's generally good practice to display things like the immediate prior chest CT 
and the oldest chest CT. But the patient's history, but if the patient's history is complex, the decision on which priors to refer to may be highly tailored. The center region is where most of the action will occur during a chest CT read. A chest CT reading, um, our chest CT reading will be constrained by our visual constraints as human beings. Although a human visual field is approximately 200 degrees wide, our high acuity foveal visual field is only about one degree of arc. Just like how we can actually read only some of the words in an area of page, area of a page of text at any one time, when we're carefully inspecting a CT image, we're really only able to carefully inspect a portion of the image at any time with our high resolution vision. Since we're looking at a portion of a CT image at any time, the visual inspection process has to be broken down in an organized way to ensure that every part of every image has been inspected by the time we're finished. The way we keep things organized is to divide our visual inspection of our CT images according to organ systems, which means that we'll be revisiting the same image multiple times, but looking at different portions of it every time, which means there tends to be a bit of scrolling back and forth. This is how the breakdown of different organ systems generally is for a chest CT, um, and we'll be evaluating these organ systems individually during the chest CT reading process. I like to compare the reading of a CT to a violinist playing music. Playing a violin requires bowing motions with the right arm and finger motions with the left hand, corded by a musical score in the violinist's head. Reading a chest CT or any CT requires mouse scrolling motions, eye motions, corded by a search pattern and medical knowledge in the radiologist's head. Here's an explanation of how the slides for the CT demo are laid out before we actually do it. At the top will be a colored header bar. On the left side of the header bar is the organ system we're in, and the, uh, on the right side of the header bar is the kernel, sharp or soft, and window width and level. In the middle will be the chest CT image and where my visual gaze is, highlighted in yellow. In the right panel is the direction, superior or inferior, that I'm scrolling with my mouse, and in the left panel is what I'm thinking about, things I'm looking for. So let's begin. I start with the technical details um, series first. I look at the DLP to get an estimate of the radiation dose and to learn if the scan was a low-dose scan or not. I then peek at the CT series titles, which tell me what sort of CT protocol was performed, uh, a PE study, interstitial lung disease protocol, for example. And usually, if a concurrent abdominal or neck CT was also performed at the same time as this chest CT. Intravenous contrast type and volume will usually appear here too, which help confirm that the CT I'm about to review is a contrast enhanced one. I then jump to the CT localizer series. Sometimes you'll get only a frontal and sometimes you'll get a frontal and a lateral image. The localizer images give you a preview of the case you're about to read and will also let you know if a concurrent abdominal CT was performed. The CT localizer in those situations usually go from the neck base to the upper thighs as opposed to stopping in the upper abdomen like this chest CT only acquisition here. The CT localizers are used by the CT tech to plan down to the millimeter where to start and where to stop the CT acquisition. Usually small portions of the patient's body at the top and bottom of localizers images will be visible here, but not appear within the CT volume. Make sure you check these regions on the localizer images since this will be the one and only time you'll see this anatomy. CT localizer series are also a nice way to brush up on your chest x-ray reading skills. The localizer images resemble a chest x-ray and you'll get ground truth as you begin looking at the CT images. Was that a real mediastinal mass you saw? Did you notice that long nozzle? I like to begin my CT read with the soft kernel axle images on a bone window. As I scroll through the tax, I'm looking for evidence that the patient has a history of cancer, things like a chest port, Hickman catheter, staple lines in the lung, evidence of a nephrectomy, lobectomy, pneumonectomy, radiation fibrosis in the lung, surgical clips at the neck base indicative of a thyroidectomy or soft tissue changes typical for a radical uh, neck dissection. I'm paying attention to indicators of cardiovascular disease. Are there sternal wires, coronary artery bypass grafts, either venous from the aorta or translocated internal mammary arteries? Are there cardiac valves? I pay attention to, for evidence that the patient has CKD. 
Is there a wide-bore dialysis catheter or stents in the central veins? Is there evidence that this patient's had a liver transplant, a heart transplant, or lung transplant, and therefore possibly immunosuppressed? Next, I change to the sharp kernel axial images on a lung kernel to begin the lungs. I begin with the central airway, starting with the trachea. I pay attention to the cross-sectional shape of the trachea to see if it's a saber-shaped trachea or if it has a biconcave fish mouth look that would suggest trachea malacia. I check to make sure the trachea is patent and that the lumen isn't abnormally narrowed focally, segmentally, or diffusely. I pay attention to make sure it isn't abnormally dilated too. I look for opacities within its lumen. Most will be mucus, but occasionally I'll come across a polyp or a growth. I also pay attention to the thickness of its wall. Sometimes I can get away with looking at the trachea wall in a lung window. Sometimes I'll need to briefly toggle to a soft tissue window. Then I'll do the same thing for the bronchi in all four lobes, one at a time, starting with the right upper lobe, traveling from center to peripheral, and then back to center, down the bronchus intermedius into the right middle lobe, into the right lower lobe, the left lower lobe, and then the left upper lobe. Now that I'm done with the airways, I'll begin assessing the pleural space. Beginning first, looking for pneumothoraces. I'll be focusing primarily on the non-dependent portions of the chest where a pneumothorax would most likely accumulate. And I can usually do the right and left sides simultaneously. For the next part of the pleural assessment, I change to a soft kernel series on a soft tissue window to look for pleural fluid and pleural thickening. I do this because sharp kernel images are just a little too noisy for inspecting for things like pleural effusion and pleural thickening, and also because, um, and also because lung windows, uh, on lung windows, pleural fat, pleural soft tissue, and pleural thickening all look similar. For this part of the search, I prefer to do one hemithorax at a time. So I'll do the right side, and then I'll do the left side. Sometimes. I like to also take a look at the pleural space from a different perspective, and I'll also inspect the pleural spaces there on the sagittal NPR. With the inspection of the pleural space completed, I begin to review the lungs on a sharp kernel and on a lung window. I'll review the lung window in three sweeps. The first sweep through the lungs is for hyperlucent findings. I'm paying attention for things like emphysema, blebs, bully, and air cysts. The second sweep through the lungs is for macroscopic opacities. We're looking here for masses, consolidation, uh, fibrosis, things like atelectasis, interstitial opacities, and ground glass opacities on this sweep. The third and final sweep is a much slower and meticulous one for lung nodules. This will require our high acuity vision and involve inspecting a portion of the lung at a time rather than the entire lung. Some people will scroll through and search the anterior third of the right lung, then the middle third, and then the posterior third and then repeat the same thing on the left side. Others may divide their search by lung lobe, where when we're searching for um, lung nodules, you'll notice that it's not just a continuous scroll from top to bottom or bottom to top, but there often is a bit of scrolling back and forth sometimes as we double check things that might have caught our eye. I like to start with the right upper lobe, working through the right middle lobe, and then coming back up through the right lower lobe. I change to the left side, looking at the left lower lobe from the base coming superior, and then the left upper lobe going from superior back inferior. After I'm done with my lung nodule search, I switch over to the axial MIPS on a lung kernel and double check to see if there's any nodules I might have missed. Axial MIPS tend to make it easier to distinguish lung nodules from lung vessels, but they can create fake outs too, making things like a small focus of atelectasis or scar sometimes look like a lung nodule. I usually do my MIPS sweep one lung at a time. So I'll do the right lung and then I'll do the left lung. That completes the review of the lungs. I switch to the soft kernel images on a soft tissue window and begin reviewing the central veins. I'll start from the right axillary vein on one side of the patient, following into the right subclavian vein and then right brachiocephalic vein, crossing midline into the left brachiocephalic vein, left subclavian vein, and left axillary vein. During this time, I'm paying attention for um, things like the caliber of the vein, if there's contrast in the lumen, whether there's obvious signs of a thrombus or occlusion. When I'm done with those veins, I inspect the SVC and azygous arch, scrolling through the right atrium to also inspect the IVC. 
We then review the heart looking for fat or calcification in the myocardial wall that might suggest an old MI. We're looking for filling defects in the intracardiac blood pool, unusual cardiac chamber contours or size. When I get to the left atrium at the level of the left ventricular outflow tract, I may check what the cross-sectional of the left atrium is at this level. If it's over 20 square centimeters or 2,000 square millimeters, I may be inclined to call left atrial enlargement. I'll continue the inspection of the heart chambers and then inspect the coronary arteries. Although it's doubtful, I can say much about the patency um, of these arteries on a non-coronary CT, um, CT um, I can pay attention for abnormal coronary artery courses and for coronary arterial calcification. I then do my inspection of the pericardium looking for fluid, soft tissue thickening, and calcification. Then I take a look at the aortic root looking for aortic valve cusp calcification. If I see something, I might pop over to a coronal MPR too. The next part of my search is the thoracic aorta and its branches. I usually start on the coronal views and I'm looking at its course, its diameter, the degree of atherosclerotic calcification, the plaque, and any intramural thrombus. If I'm not jumping in to a 3D workstation, the coronal MPRs are where I may drop a caliper marking or two to estimate the diameter of the aorta. I then go back to the actual soft kernel images with a soft tissue window to take another look at the thoracic aorta, again paying attention to things like its size, its lumen, the wall, and the soft tissues immediately surrounding it. I also take a quick peek at the large vessels branching from the aortic arch as well. Next, I begin my review of the pulmonary alpha tract and the pulmonary arteries. If this is a non-contrast study, I'm basically just inspecting their size. While if there's contrast on board, I'm also looking for thrombus and other filling defects. I'll do my best to inspect the pulmonary arteries in each lobe, one lobe at a time, working from center to peripheral and then back to center again, one lobe at a time. Next, I begin my review of the GI tract and esophagus. I inspect the gastric cardia, the stomach, and then begin scrolling superiorly to inspect the esophagus. The sensitivity and specificity for picking up esophageal disease is pretty limited on chest CT, though I pay attention for obvious masses, um, unusually um, eccentric wall thickening, endoluminal lesions, and esophageal dilation. I pay attention to whether the fat surrounding the esophagus appears clean Though in thinner patients and on low-dose non-contrast chest CTs, it's usually uh, very difficult to see much of the esophagus at all. I then check the thyroid, making a note of its size and for any obvious, uh, any obvious foci that are either high or hyperattenuating um, within it, remembering that 15 millimeters is the cutoff for considering ultrasound in adults 35 and over, according to the ACR white papers. Then I scoot down the anterior mediastinum looking for any abnormal soft tissue opacities or masses. Now I begin my thoracic lymph node inspection, beginning with anterior, middle, and posterior diaphragmatic lymph nodes, or what some folks refer to as anterior cardiophrenic, paracaval, and retrocural lymph nodes. I then check the paraesophageal lymph nodes, the subcarinal lymph nodes, the right hilar and peribronchial lymph nodes, the left hilar and left peribronchial lymph nodes, the mediastinal lymph nodes, low cervical lymph nodes, right axillary, right subpectoral lymph nodes, left axillary, left subpectoral lymph nodes, the internal mammary chain lymph nodes, and then the intercostal lymph nodes along the thoracic spine, one side at a time, starting on the right side, and then finishing on the left side. Now I review the upper abdomen, beginning with a uh, liver window and inspecting the liver for steatosis. Usually I'm looking for liver parenchymal attenuation that's at least 10 Hounsfield units less than the spleen or an absolute attenuation value of under 40 Hounsfield units. I'm paying attention for nodular liver contours indicative of cirrhosis or for any cysts or masses in the liver too. I look to see if the spleen is enlarged or missing or if there are any abnormal lesions within it. Now I jump to a normal soft tissue window to view 
to review the remaining anatomy, anatomy in the upper abdomen, the kidneys, the adrenal glands, the pancreas, the stomach again, colon, mesenteric fat, and whatever vascular structures I can make out on these um, limited images of the upper abdomen. And finally, I jump back to the top of the stack and begin evaluating the chest wall. Since the chest wall is a lot of territory to inspect, I usually break it into six segments I scroll through one at a time. The anterior right, the anterior left, the lateral right, the posterior right, the posterior left, and the lateral left chest wall. Then I switch over to a bone window and begin reviewing the thoracic skeleton. I tend to like to start with the right shoulder, the right scapula, then move across to the right clavicle, the manubrium, the left clavicle, the left shoulder and scapula. Then I like to look at the sternum, come up the thoracic spine, and then review the ribs. Uh, I usually do one side at a time. There's just a lot of kind of different segments of ribs we're seeing at any time in any image. And then I'll review the thoracic skeleton on the sagittal MPRs, beginning with the ribs on one side, the thoracic spine, the manubrium, the sternum, and then the ribs on the other side. And I'll usually take a peek at the coronal MPRs as well to see if there's anything I might have missed. Um, this is where I often catch rib fractures too. And that's the way a chest CT can be read. Reviewing a chest CT by system is generally how most folks have been taught to read chest CTs since the PAX era began. Um, the order in which we may read these various organ systems um, may certainly differ from person to person, but the general concepts of what we look at and how we look at them is relatively consistent. Uh, there may be differences in how quickly uh, folks may review a chest CT, which are related to a lot of factors, um, such as how much um, you choose to refer, rely on your peripheral vision, how large you display the CT images physically on your display, um, your level of fastidiousness and your level of fatigue. Um, interruptions to your chest CT read will occur in normal life. Every time you need to make a comparison to a prior study or every time a consult comes in in the form of a, um, a colleague walking into the room or a phone call. And having a standard approach to reading a chest CT is extremely helpful in minimizing the impact of these on your read.